Welcome to Jenny's Kitchen. It's that time of the year where comfort foods adorn our table. And on today's show, I'm going to show you how to make two of my favorite comfort food meals, an Italian stuffed meatloaf and a wonderful chicken pot pie made with puff pastry. I have two wonderful guests also on the show today that are going to be talking to you about foods and are going to be showing you how to prepare some of their favorite meals. And with that said, I'd like to introduce my first guest, CJ. CJ, would you come join me, please? Good morning. Hey, Good morning. This is CJ from Angel's Market. I know many of you have seen him before. And he's going to be on me for two presentations today, our chicken pot pie and our Italian stuffed meatloaf. So with that said, I'm going to start, CJ. And um, I was at the market yesterday, and I picked up some wonderful ground beef. Can you tell the viewers the difference between ground round and ground beef? Yeah, our ground beef is going to be ground chuck, which is roughly 80-20%, 80% lean, 20% fat. A lot of flavor in the ground beef. Yes, the there is. ground beef is 90-10, 90% lean, 10% fat. It's more lean, so the fat flavor in that beef is not going to be there. It's more seasonings. You get a lot less grease out of it. But if you're in it for the flavor, the ground beef's the way to go. Well, I found even your ground beef doesn't have a lot of fat in it. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, There's not a lot of grease. It's yeah. great. It, it is a lean one. 80-20, you find 25% in other stores, 30 in some. Yes, I've seen that. That's why I love Angel's Market Meats. Then I also picked up some Italian sausage. And I know you guys make your own there. So you want to tell the viewers about what goes into your Italian sausage? Sure. We grind the uh, pork butt, which is a pork shoulder. And it has a good amount of fat in there, good flavor. And then we have an in-house uh, recipe of our Italian seasoning blend. Salt, pepper, paprika, some garlic, onion, fennel, a little dried thyme, oregano, sage. It's so delicious. it's a nice mixture of seasonings. It's absolutely delicious. Well, I'm going to make this Italian stuffed meatloaf for you now. And CJ, if one of our viewers wanted to grind their own beef, what choice of meat, what cut of meat would you recommend to them? For our regular beef, I would go ground chuck. It has the best flavor. It's good. Not too much fat. If you're going on the leaner side, I'd probably take a sirloin tip. Okay. It's really lean. You don't have to take off much to get the ground. And then you just add some seasoning to get the flavor in there. Well, I used to buy a chuck roast and in the process or cube it and kind of grind my own because I could control the amount of fat I was getting. But when I come to your market, I don't have to do that anymore because your meat is so superb and has the right amount of everything in it. Okay, so here we have our ground beef and our Italian sausage. And to that, I'm going to add some sauteed onions and garlic that I have pre-sauteed. Now, if you want to put your onions in raw, you can do that too. You'll have a little crunch, but maybe some of you like, you know, crunchy onions, which is fine. Here's a little red bell pepper that I also sauteed in some olive oil. We're going to add that to our mix. And then we're going to add some dried basil and some dried oregano, really Italiano some salt, some pepper, 
Good old fashioned meatloaf made a new way. And then we're going to add some breadcrumbs. Now you can buy the Italian breadcrumbs if you like. Uh, you can buy the plain. I always just take the heels of the bread when I purchase the bread and um, make my own in my processor. And then we're going to add a couple of eggs. My dad loved brown eggs, and so I've ever since I was cooking for my dad, I've always purchased brown eggs. You're just going to beat them up a little bit, not a lot. You're going to pour that on top. And then we're going to mix it up. You can fold it in like you would if you were kneading bread. And you'll be able to tell from the consistency of your meat if you want to add more breadcrumbs or less breadcrumbs. If you need to add more liquid or less liquid. And you want to mix everything together. Now, CJ, I heard that when you're purchasing beef, if it has some shades of brown, it's more flavorful. Do you want to speak to that? Is that true? Yeah, so you're talking about aged beef there. Right, correct. Yeah, actually dry aged beef is a hot item on the market. Really? Yeah, it's pretty expensive, really flavorful, nice and tender. So when you see, you know, maybe a steak in the counter. Right. It's looking a little darker, all the rest is really red, nice bright red colors. Right. That's probably going to be the better steak in the counter there. Well, I know what I'm going to look for the next time that I come in. Those are my steaks that I take home. <laughs> now here's uh, some tomato juice. We're going to add some tomato juice. And then we're going to add a little bit of red wine to that as well. And I'm going to add some rough cut chopped parsley. Not a lot, but a little. And this will, um, when you cook it in with your meatloaf, it will get smaller as you cook it. So that's why I'm saying you can rough chop it. You don't have to make it fine. Gosh, don't you love that aroma? Yeah, really I love that aroma of fresh parsley. We're going to add this to our meatloaf now. And we're going to add the rest of our breadcrumbs. I could tell when I was mixing that that um, it was feeling a little too wet. So now with that said, everything is together here. Mm, yeah, this is going to be a good consistency now. I love meatloaf. I do too. I really love meatloaf. It's, you know, um, and you know, I like to experiment. Sometimes I use turkey whenever I make my meatloaf or I'll get some chicken and I'll grind the breasts and, or you can get ground chicken, you know. Yeah. I just, I like meatloaf and it depends on what type of meat that I'm using, the ingredients that go in with it. Like if I was going to be doing a turkey or a chicken, I'd be adding grated carrots that I'd cook in a little white wine. And oh, this feels, this is good. <laughs> if you can tell, if, if you can roll it into a ball and it's not too hard or it's not too wet, then you know you've got the right consistency. CJ, could you hand me that piece of parchment paper, please? Thank you. And I'm going to have you set it here on this board. And then I'm going to have you pick up this bowl, please. And if you can put the bowl where the parchment paper was. I like to get everything out of the bowl. Okay, if you could do that, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now, just lay a piece of parchment paper if you have it, or a piece of foil. And you want to lay this out. Try to make a rectangle. It doesn't have to be a perfect rectangle, but try to make the best rectangle that you can. Okay. It smells so good. Thank you. I can't, I can't wait to eat it. And then to that, we're going to add some basil leaves. Just kind of cover the tops. 
Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I used to also like to steam broccoli and put broccoli in the middle of a meatloaf. That's really good whenever you roll it up. You could just, like I always tell you to, create your own essence. Do it, do it right. Okay, this, this looks pretty full. Eh, maybe a couple here. Then, CJ, could you take this lid off for me, please? Thank you. We're going to sprinkle some of these sun-dried tomatoes. Now, if you use the kind that are not in olive oil, you're going to have to poach them in a liquid first. That's why I always buy the kind that are in olive oil already. And you don't have to cover every bit of the meatloaf, but just try to get as much as you can. And then we're going to add some fresh mozzarella. Now, I've recently made friends with fresh mozzarella. I used to always buy the, you know, the low fat or the non-fat, sometime with a little bit of fat. But then I realized that our bodies need fat. They need good fat, not bad fat, but good fat. And cheese is a nice way to get good fat, with, along with avocados and olive oil and things like that. Fresh mozzarella, if you haven't used it, please use it. It melts beautifully. The taste is divine. And I'm just going to lay that over the meatloaf like this. Is this going to be a feast or what, CJ? Yeah, how many people are we going to feed? Oh, probably, we, you could probably feed at least a minimum of eight, at least. You know, with probably a little left over for sandwiches as well. Always a little left over. Got to have a little left over. Okay, now you're going to start at the short end. And using your parchment paper, your foil, you're going to roll this. And you're going to keep rolling it. Okay, CJ, could you bring me that clear glass bowl, please? Thank you so much. And just set that right in front. Thank you. And then you're going to pick it up and put it seam side down into your pan. Now that's what I call a meatloaf, folks. Look at that baby. And then you can put mustard on top or ketchup. You could put a little marinara sauce and you're going to bake this at 375 degrees for about an hour. CJ, thank you. I'll see you uh, in a little bit. In a little thank bit. Thank you so much. My next guest is my dear friend, Dave McElhaney. Dave and I have an internet TV cooking show, elementarytv.com, if you're interested. Dave is very pronounced in cooking. He's been to the Culinary Academy. He's a chef at Wine Wizards on Friday nights, and he's in the process of writing a cookbook. He's a marvelous cook. I'm so proud to share my kitchen with him. Dave, would you come on and join me, please? Good morning. Hi, Jenny. Good to see you as always. Happy to be here. Well, Dave's going to be making a marvelous wild mushroom pudding. So with that said, take over. All righty. Bread puddings are always uh, one of my favorite desserts. And a lot of times we think of them as dessert. But um, for Jenny's segment today about comfort foods, uh, comfort foods are always my favorite types of food and favorite time of year. So I'm always looking for different ways to have a side with the different protein or meats that we're using. So um, one of the things I came up with was uh, to use with beef especially, but this works well with roast pork or chicken. Um, I came up with a wild mushroom bread pudding. So today we have a savory bread pudding instead of your typical sweet bread pudding. And like Jenny says, in her show, your imagination can make this whatever you want. Today we're going to do it with uh, wild mushrooms and some cheese and cream, but you could certainly put whatever flavorings that, that you desire. This goes really well with uh, the meatloaf that she's making. It also goes great with a nice steak or a filet or prime rib. And what I like to do when I serve it at the restaurant will occasionally put like a red wine sauce or a demi-glaze and kind of ladle that over both. And it's just a really nice, uh, makes for a nice presentation. And also it's a really nice side and a little bit different. So happy to share that today. So what I've done in advance is I've taken some wild mushrooms. I've taken chanterelles, uh, moral, 
uh, oyster mushrooms, some porcini, and a little bit of shiitake. And I sauteed those in some butter, just a small amount. And well, first I started with some shallots, cut those up, diced them, uh, sauteed those in butter till they were soft, then add the mushrooms. And you wanna saute the mushrooms until they're uh, basically dry, because they'll start to sweat as you cook them. So you cook them down till they're about dry. Then I added a couple cloves of garlic, minced, some salt and pepper, and finally some Italian parsley. And you can do that to your taste or the different herbs. Um, thyme goes really good with this too, but uh, today we did it with Italian parsley. So that's our essential starting mixture. So I'm gonna put that into the bowl. Sort of Smells simple. delicious, Dave. It's hard to go wrong with wild mushrooms if you like that flavor. Mmm, what a nice aroma. It sure. smells wild too. Thank you. And uh, to that, we're going to add our eggs. And for this amount of mushrooms, I started with about a pound and a half chopped. We're going to add four eggs, slightly beaten. So we'll pour that in. And yeah. what. Did you season the eggs? I didn't. Okay. No, I'm going to season it all. When, okay. I did season the mushrooms. Oh, of course. Just to get a little bit of flavor started. Sure. So you're not chasing it through the whole process. Well, I didn't want the viewers to season the eggs and then see you season it at the end, it become over salty or over seasoned or right. something. Okay. And what the eggs are going to do is it's going to provide a little bit of lift as, as the bread pudding cooks. Got to get my hands in there. <laughs> Go fine. ahead, Dave. Now, if you could hand me the cream. I would be more than glad to hand you the cream. And this, I've used a mixture of uh, cream and half and half. You could use full half and half. You could use full cream. I like the richness of cream, but I don't, it's a little too rich if you use it all the way. So you could thin it with milk. In this case, I did it with half and half. So uh, about two cups for the four eggs and the amount of mushrooms that we have. And we'll stir that up. And right now, it's still pretty loose. It is. It's very loose. Yeah. yeah. And you want it a little yeah. bit loose because what I've done is taken some breadcrumbs, uh, some stale bread, and then roasted it in the oven just to crisp them up. And we're gonna add that to it. And these bread, or the bread crumbs, are gonna absorb the moisture and give us the body to our, our uh, bread pudding. Excellent choice for the bread is like a challa bread. Um, I'm, I'm using, I had some French bread uh, with the crust. And if you have leftover bread, and that's what they used to do, that's how bread puddings came about. They used, it was a peasant food, and they used to use their leftover parts from their kitchen. Now, did you use a sweet French or a sourdough French? I did, I used a sweet French a sweet bread. sweet French, okay. Yeah. Sweet French. And same thing if you're making a sweet one, you can vary the breads too. But here we have just a regular French bread. I cut it small. If you're using, we're going to put it into small ramekins today, but if you're using a bigger casserole type dish, you could certainly make the breadcrumbs into bigger sizes. Like okay, These are so like this quarter. is right. So this is what the breadcrumb is now. Right. But if they were using a bigger container, they could put like four of these together and they could get a chunk that looked like about this, about that size there, correct? Right. Got it. it. Would just okay. look more rustic. Exactly. Or these right. smaller ones fit better for the small. Now, is this bread going to puff once it cooks? It'll. It'll puff a little bit, and like I said, it'll, it almost makes a, um, um, like French toast. Got it. it oh, to yeah, make. okay. So it, a it little puffy. Okay. Moisture. And it absorbs the moisture better when it's stale, or if, if you don't have stale bread, make sure you toast it a bit in the oven so that it's a little bit harder. So we're going to add that to our mixture. I'll hold the bowl while you beat. All right. And what you want to do is once you get the breadcrumbs in, you'll want to let it sit 10 minutes or so, so it absorbs the extra liquid in your dish. Um, you don't want to put it directly right into the oven because then you'll, it'll be, it won't absorb it as good and it won't be, the texture won't be quite as nice. So let it sit about 10 minutes or so once you have it all mixed up. So the liquid makes the bread come from a dry to a semi-soft, is that what you're saying? It does. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. 
So we'll put that in and then I'm going to put about a half cup of, I have a grated Parmesan Reggiano cheese. Okay. Put about a half cup in there just to enrich it a little bit. Oh my gosh, this is going to be delish. I'm not a mushroom lover, but I'm dying to try this. This will make you into a mushroom lover, Jenny. Good. <laughs> a little cracked pepper. Pepper and I put, I'm going to just put a pinch or so of salt because, and this is a kosher salt. I've already put the salt and pepper into the mushroom mixture, so I don't need a whole lot. And we will mix this up. And then mm. Jenny, while I'm yeah. doing this, yes. can you show them how to butter I would love to do a that. casserole dish? Okay, do these, I've already, okay. these I've already buttered, but we wanted to show you how to do that. Okay, this is very easy. You just take a slice of butter, start with your sides, just roll it around. Those of you that are artists and like the paint get the idea. And it goes around like this. I, it broke off, so we only need this. Then get the bottom. And what's most important is that you make sure that you run your hands. I usually use a couple of fingers. Get in all the creases at the bottom and along the side. And then do the same for the bottom to where it's thoroughly, thoroughly coated. How's that, Dave? That's great. Good. And the best part of that was I didn't have to get my hands. <laughs> oh, there was a trick to that. I get it. It was, but you did a great job. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so, this could probably be a little bit looser, but it'll loosen up as the... As it sits. As it sits. Yeah. But for way of demonstration, we're going to go ahead and put it into the ramekins right now. So we'll go ahead and if you could... I would love to. I don't know the best way to do this since it's kind of a... Here, I have, I have a real good idea. Let's get this. Oh, that's a good idea. There we go. Leave it to a woman. And I th give it a little bit of room. So you fill it about three quarters of the Yeah, I'd fill it about three quarters. Because right? what it's going to do, ideally, is it's going to rise in the oven and it's going to come up over it like a popover or like oh, a Oh, very like good. A or little. a cupcake. Exactly. Yeah, so got it's it. going to come up probably about a half inch over it and then it'll settle back down. And hopefully because we buttered it, it will unmold really easily and make for a nice presentation. Now, Dave, when you uh, do you put this in a water bath or do you just leave the pan you're going to put it in dry or do you just put those on the rack or what? I, I do not use a water bath okay. for this. Okay. For regular puddings, yes, you do. Yes. And um, that's always suggested. On these, you don't need to. Okay. Um, so it makes it just a little bit even easier. Okay, very good. So I'll put these in. All right. And uh, So you can either serve this individually or, like Dave said, you could put everything in here and then cut it into squares. Yeah, it lends itself to a lot of different presentations. So if you want more of a high-end presentation for a nice dinner party, I right. think it's nice to use a smaller ramekin like this Me and then too. unmold it. Me too. But if you're serving a family and it's just a weeknight meal, then I typically will use uh, some type of casserole pan or you could use a soup tureen. Um, and it's pretty rich, so you don't need a lot. huge servings. Yeah. yeah I, I, this is more than enough for a single serving for someone. Okay, and, and then, then if you the want to put this, it into I would be more than glad to do there. that for you. Do you need this? Uh, no, I'm just going to go, what, now that my hands are greasy, um, I'm just going to go ahead and plop this in. And what I discovered when I was researching kind of the origin of uh, bread pudding is they used to have big tall ovens over in Europe and that was the hottest part of the oven and that's where they would do their main cooking but off to the side they'd have chambers in the oven and that's where they would do their breads or their puddings because they still had all the heat from the oven so they didn't want to waste the heat so they'd make a lot of side dishes like this in the side of their oven in the cooler part and so that's where a lot of this originated from. Now, Dave, could you sprinkle some chopped parsley on this or mm -hmm. some sprigs of like a sprig of fresh thyme on the top or something? It would be delicious. Okay. You could put cheese on it too. Okay. There's enough cheese in it. I, and you'll see when we pull it out of the oven, it'll have a really nice brown 
um, crust That's to That's why I was thinking more herb than cheese since you've already put an ample amount of yeah, cheese in. But you could certainly, yeah, top it with something or, or make it to your particular taste. Okay, and what temperature, Dave? We're going to cook this now at 350 for about 30 to 35 minutes. Keep an eye on it depending on your oven. And like I said, you'll want it to rise and you want it to have a nice golden top. All right, I'm going to let you pop that in the oven. All righty. Put this in right now. The big one. Oh, that's right. It should be nice and hot. Yeah. All right. All right, thank you so much. I'll see you at the presentation, Dave. Very good. Mm, this looks delicious. There's nothing more comforting than a nice slice of chicken pot pie on a cold, stormy day. And on today's show, I'm going to show you how to make a great chicken pot pie in two easy steps. And our first step is going to be how to make our broth for our gravy and how to cook our vegetables. And our friend CJ is coming back on to show you how to cut up a chicken. CJ, can you join me again, please? I would love to. Thank you. Now, this is a smart chicken, but according to what Donnie Marshall says, if they were smart, they would have really got away. Yeah. So what makes a smart chicken a smart chicken, CJ? So the smart chicken is an air chilled chicken, which is the first United States chicken processing company to not use water to cool the, the bird down. So birds never touch each other when they're in this plant. So if one bird, say, it was contaminated with a disease, it's not going to give it to all the other birds. It's very Where, smart. As in, like, Foster Farms or a different chicken company, they're in big tanks. All the chickens are in water that is touching other chicken. So that's it's kind of bad. You want to stay away from that. Now, these are also cage-free chickens. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't pump them full of hormones or no, the other stuff. No, antibiotic-free. Yeah, antibiotic-free. That's why I love smart chickens. And you can tell the difference. Another difference you can tell is after you cook it, there isn't any water in this bird. So you cook it, it's the same size as when you throw it in. You take it out. A lot of the chicken companies, it'll shrink actually, you know, you because end up with a big water, breast. Yeah. I see. So that's what I always wondered why that was like that. And now I know. All right. So with that said, do you want to say anything more about smart chickens? You want to start? No. I can show okay. You how to cut one up. Okay. Now pay attention, folks. This is important. All right. We're going to flip it over and take the wings off first. You find a little join in there. There's a ball right there. You just come right around. Super. One wing off. Two wings off. Okay, I'm going to pop these in the pot. Now I notice that the little wing tip is yeah. off. Do you do the you smart do that? Chicken comes like that. The smart actually. chicken comes yeah. like that. Okay, good. All right, very good. And if you're doing Super Bowl Sunday and you want to separate them, just do what CJ did. Yeah. Boop, cut it right there, okay? So then we're going to take a leg off, go down to the joint. Pop that joint out. Look at how easy that was. Okay. Thigh drum. Boy, you got that right on the money, buddy. Yeah, it's my very first nice. Time. Yeah, I can <laughs> tell your first rodeo, as they'd say. Okay, look at that. Beautiful. Of course, needless to say, this chicken has been washed and patted dry. Very nice, CJ. So here's the back. Take it. Kind of right. break it there, right. yeah. Very good. You know, I remember in the old days when I was growing up, you could find all the backs in containers to make broth with, and now you can't find backs wow. like you used to. I don't know what they do with them, but... Okay, very good. It's the other rib cage here. Nicely done, CJ. Okay, whoops, can you give me a little... Oh. Thank you. And the breast. So you start at the top end of the breast yeah. and you go right down to where that the white part is. As it'll be like a V, the sternum. Yeah, and you, you cut right get your through knife the to the bottom. Roll it back on that. Oh, I see. Very good. And if those are too big to work with, you could even quarter it. Go ahead. Kind of make it a smaller piece here. Very nice. Have you ever boned a chicken, CJ? I have. 
Well, guess what? On our next show, I'll have you come and show us how to bone a chicken. All right. Got a great recipe for a bone chicken. You wouldn't even know there wasn't a bone in it. It's plump and it's beautiful. And Okay, very good. Now, this is how you start your chicken pot pie. Then you're going to add some kale. I've discovered this new wonderful vegetable that I absolutely adore. Some uh, celery. Now, I like to take the leaves because the leaves are really good in a, when you're making a stock. And we're going to add those. And then here's an onion that I quartered. We're going to add that. We're going to add a little bit of water to this. I like to use the purified water as well. I mean, if I'm starting with the smart chicken, I want to have smart water. And we're going to just do about half of this. Then these carrots have been washed as well. And I'm just going to cut off the tops. And then in order to save yourself a step, what you're going to do is you're going to cut these carrots. I'm going to cut off the tip tops. Let me get this one that I missed. And then this. You're going to cut them in the shape that you want them so you don't have to cook another batch of carrots. You're going to cook it right in with the uh, stock and you're going to use that. So I just kind of like to cut all my veggies on a slant. I never peel my carrots because I believe there's a lot of vitamin in the peel itself. Okay, then we're going to add some bay leaves. Never get enough bay leaf in there. A cinnamon stick. And, oh, smell that. Mm. Is that not delicious or what? It smells delicious. Here's some star anise. You can get anise seed, ground anise, but here's some star anise. It imparts a wonderful, delicious flavor that you normally wouldn't find in a chicken broth. You're going to add that. We're going to sprinkle on, if I can get this right, we're going to sprinkle it on. Some salt. And some pepper. Got to have garlic. And we're going to finish up with the water now. Okay, it's coming to the top. I'm going to lid this and put it on the stove and let it cook probably at least an hour, a good hour and a half. And if you want, if you're really busy doing something, turn it on really almost to a simmer. You could cook this for a couple of hours. And then what I do is I strain the stock. But I'll talk about that when I'm getting ready to put everything together. Thank you. You did wonderful, CJ. Viewers, I hope you appreciate how easy it is to cut up a chicken. So your chicken is cooked, your vegetables are cooked, and you have your broth, and everything's in a pot. This is a chin soie, and it's a double layer of uh, straining material. So as you remove your chicken, remove your vegetables, you're left with the broth, all the star anise, and all the cinnamon sticks, and the whole garlic, and any other pieces of chicken fat maybe that have come to the top will all stay in this. And then as you pour your broth through into a bowl or a pitcher, Beautiful clear broth comes through and all your waste product is in this. So with that said, because my family loves chicken breasts, they aren't too much on dark meat, I always like to throw in a couple of chicken uh, breasts in along with the whole chicken that I'm using as well. You get more flavor from a whole chicken because it has a skin to where skinless boneless chicken breasts you don't. So here's some of the chicken breasts that I cut up. We're just going to add this. And then here's the carrots that I had cut on a diagonal. We're going to add these. And the beautiful kale that I had put in. And then about the last 15, 20 minutes, if you want, you can add some washed cut up potato. The reason why I don't do it at the beginning is the potatoes would be too mushy and I don't want all the starch to be imparted into the broth. 
And here are some of those potatoes. This purple potato comes out to look like this. It actually is purple when you cook it. And then the white potatoes are, of course, your white potatoes. And then the red ones are down at the very bottom, of course, that have now turned purple because of the purple, but that's no big deal. OK, kind of mix that up. Let's add some more chicken. Whoa, sorry. Accidents do happen in the kitchen. Let's add some more chicken to that. And then I like to add a little bit of sweet. So I'm going to add some dried cranberries to all this as well. Yum. And if there's room for more chicken, what the heck, I'll add some of that. Now, here's the gravy that I made with some of the chicken broth. It's so easy. What you want to do is you want to put in a quarter cup of butter, and when it's melted, add a quarter cup of flour. And then I stand at the stove for two or three minutes and just stir it over a low heat because that will dispel that real floury taste. And then I'll gradually add a couple of cups of the chicken broth until it gets to the consistency that I want. So I've done that. And because this has been in the refrigerator, it's really thick now. When you make it, it'll be thin. And then you're just going to put this on top. And all this gravy, as it bubbles, it'll seep down to the, to the very, very bottom. Of course, you can season with your salt and pepper and garlic, just the very standard. No fancy seasonings, because remember, that chicken broth that you made had some phenomenal flavors in that. And if you want, you can toss it around. But rest assured that the gravy will get down to the very bottom of the pan. So for two quick steps that you don't have to be cooking all the time, let the chicken and the broth go. Let it cool, cut up your chicken. Your vegetables are already prepared for you. Add it like this. You have a wonderful meal. Now, normally when you make a chicken pot pie, you'd put a crust on the bottom and then a regular pie crust on the top. Well, today I'm going to use puff pastry because I love how puff pastry works. It's true to its name. As it cooks, it puffs. So I'm going to show you what not to do. I took this puff pastry out of the refrigerator too early. This was supposed to have been a rectangle shape. As you can see now, it's wider at one end and not as wide at the bottom. It should just be a nice solid sheet. I took it out too early. What I should have done is waited until I had this mixed and then bring out my puff pastry and unwrap it and put it on top. Live and learn, right? Okay, so with that said, we're just going to pop this around. Just kind of tuck it down under our pot pie. Make sure it's in there nice. You can also whip an egg and brush this with egg, and it'll make it a beautiful golden, golden brown. But I'm just going to leave it plain. And then we're going to pop this in the oven about 425 for about 20 minutes, and it'll be ready to eat. So I'll see you at the presentation. Well, here you have it, folks. Comfort food fit for your family and company as well. Look at how beautiful and puffy Dave's wild mushroom pudding came out. You want to talk a minute about it? Is this how beautiful it's supposed to be, Dave? Yeah, I think it looks good. It's nice and golden. When you first take it out of the oven, <clears throat> it was about a half inch higher, but as it sat for a few minutes, it's settled back down kind of like a souffle. So this is how it should look. It'll be nicely browned on top. Thank you, Dave. Here's our chicken pot pie. The gravy is all bubbling around the outside, and we're going to cut into our Italian stuffed meatloaf now, and I'm going to show you how beautiful the inside looks. Let me pull that away. Look at that. Mmm, boy, that steam's popping right out. But can you see how the um, basil and the sun-dried tomatoes and the cheese are all peeking out from in between the meat? Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy these favorite comfort foods with a little twist of Jenny. And we'll see you on the next show.
Thanks for watching.